Last time we talked about what ray tracing actually is, and we shifted the sphere. Today we'll continue to draw inspiration from reality as we delve into reflections, but before that let's take a look at the previous code. The previous code was really messy and although it had somewhat of a structure it was challenging to work with. So let's refactor it. First let's begin by defining our classes. The camera, this class is defined by the vector camera origin and the floats width and height which are the viewport's dimensions. The ray, it is an origin and the direction. It includes a method which returns a point on the ray t units away from the origin. The sphere, defined by its position, radius and color. The method heat helps determine whether and where a ray intersects the sphere, returning a heat info. The heat info stores data about the ray sphere intersection, like where a ray hits the object, its surface normal T and surface color. Moving on, we have the fragment or frag function. It is called for each screen pixel and returns the pixel's color. Now, keep the camera as it was and color each pixel based on frag's output. One sphere is good, but what about you? In a true 3D world, besides the fact we're not working only with spheres, we will find multiple objects. So to incorporate multiple spheres, we'll have to verify whether a ray intersects with them. In other words, instead of finding the intersection between the ray and one sphere, we can do that for two spheres. or however many we want. At the moment we are rendering the spheres based on the order they were created, which leads to sphere B always being drawn over sphere A. And of course in reality we should only render the closest sphere to the camera. To fix this issue we can check the closest intersection point to the camera. The smallest hit info T corresponds to the closest point. That makes sense, since those points on the ray are T units from the origin. Basically, the smaller the T, the fewer units from the camera, so the closer to the camera given point is. Now, this program works fine for sphere A and B, but what about sphere C, or D, or E, F, G, and I forgot the alphabet from now on. As you can see, the more complicated the scene gets, the more overwhelming the code will get, and repeating this process just for 15 spheres is just self torture. So, logically, when dealing with multiple elements in programming, you want to store them into arrays. You can append each sphere into a sphere's array and just loop through them. The code checks the intersection with every sphere and keeps count of the closest one. In the end, drawing only the closest sphere. But if the ray doesn't hit anything, we can just return the background color. This chapter is going to be pretty complicated, but now the actual fun part of ray tracing will start, and just before that make sure to keep the ray calculations inside this ray color function, you will see later on. Diffuse materials don't emit light on their own, just like mirrors, they simply reflect the color of surrounding objects. How will this work? When a ray intersects with a sphere, we can simply recast that ray in a random direction, starting from the intersection with the sphere. Now, each time the ray reflects, we can multiply the color by a fractional number, thus the over-reflected lights will slowly lose their original color. Calculating the direction of the reflected ray involves obtaining a random vector in the exterior of the object, specifically in the same hemisphere as the sphere's normal. To accomplish this, let's start with the basics and generate random vectors within the range of 0 to 1. We can map these vectors between negative 1 and 1 to centralize them around the origin. Next, we can generate random unit vectors. If a vector's length is greater than 1, that means they are inside the unit cube, not sphere. And as you might know, a cube has those annoying corners which might become an inconvenience when trying to distribute random vectors evenly. Next, we can finally create a function where we generate a random vector in the same hemisphere as normal. If their dot product is negative, then they are not in the same hemisphere. So we can just invert the vector. Let's assign a material to each sphere. 
which will indicate the color in the diffuse bulb. We can keep count of the sphere material inside the heat info and if we indeed heat a diffuse sphere, we know that the ray has to be reflected in a random direction inside the normal hemisphere and will change its origin effectively. We're going to just recast this ray and multiply that cast result by alpha, which I will set to 0.7. That's a lot of information to grasp, so in a nutshell, ray hits a diffuse sphere, ray updates, the new ray is cast and its color is multiplied by 0.7. To create more accurate diffuse materials, we'll use the Lambertian distribution. In real life, the manner in which reflected rays are distributed is proportional to the cosine of the angle between the surface normal and the reflected ray. This fact describes that rays are more likely to reflect at an angle close to the normal. The good news is that this reflection is really easy to compute. The direction of the reflected ray is simply the sum between the normal and a random vector on the unit sphere. You can visualize it as a simple offset on the normal's head. Those are called Lambertian distributions. Okay, this video took me a lot of time to make and I haven't even finished covering the basics of reflection. There is certainly a lot more to cover. And at this point I should mention that this entire series is inspired by the book Ray Tracing in One Weekend, which is my main learning source, so if you want to learn more, you should take a look in the description. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down below and Merry Christmas!